Welcome everyone to well, uh, Refugee Welcome Collective Lunch and Learn series. In these sessions, we aim to bring you interesting and timely information. Whether you are a volunteer, community sponsor, resettlement agency staff, a local advocate, or just someone who's interested in learning more, we hope that you enjoy today's session, demystifying the continuum of fear. Refugee Welcome Collective collaborates with partners to provide in-depth training programs, weekly learning sessions, resources, and on-demand technical assistance for sponsors, resettlement agency staff, refugees paired with sponsors, community and institutional partners, and other to support quality community sponsorship programs across the United States. We can now go to the next slide, please. Just for housekeeping, uh, as a reminder to everyone joining us today, this, uh, there is a control panel on your upper right-hand corner uh, that will allow you to submit questions through the questions box. There will be a time toward the end of our webinar for Q&A, so please take your time to just uh, send your Q&A during the webinar and toward the end we're going to answer them. Um, and everyone on today's webinar is going to be automatically muted. However, if you have any technical issues, please raise your hand through the control panel or submit a question in the questions box so we can assist you. Additionally, the presentation and any resources and recording will be sent to everyone following today's webinar. Um, and that brings us to our presenter for today, Lynette Farrell. She is the Senior Associate um, Director of Housing uh, with Refugee Housing Solutions. Uh, Lynette, you can take it from here. Thank you, Joy. Um, it's always a pleasure to be here. So let's jump right in. Next slide. So as you guys know, I am with Church World Service, but with Refugee Housing Solutions. And today we are going to talk about the continuum of care. We're going to demystify it. Next slide. And so today's webinar, here's our learning objectives. Um, we're going to learn what the COC is. That is the, the acronym for continuum of care. Um, the core elements of the COC, um, what a lead agency is, um, the responsibilities of a COC, and the benefits of participating. Um, and one thing we also need to know is what is the coordinated entry system because they go hand in hand. They're kind of like the hands of the COC and we'll talk about that. And then what their responsibilities are. And then we're going to talk a little bit about some HUD language, um, the homeless definitions by HUD standards, and the core elements of the CES, which is the acronym from Coordinated Entry System. And we're going to go over some of the largest HUD funded CES programs through the COC. Next slide. So what is the continuum of care? Um, there are systems in place to discuss the needs of individuals experiencing homelessness. And one of the largest systems that HUD uses is the continuum of care. Next slide. So I'm going to just give a brief overview with the continuum of care and how it was established. Um, in 2009, at that time, President Obama amended and reauthorized the HUD's McKinney uh, Vental Homeless Assistance Program Act into the Homeless Emergency Assistance and Relief Rapid Transition to Housing, known as the HEARTH Act. Um, the HEARTH Act expanded HUD's homeless uh, assistance programs um, consolidating the three separate programs into a grant program we know now known as the continuum of care. So according to HUD regulations, a COC is a community plan, again, a community plan to organize and deliver housing services um, to meet the specific, I'm gonna say that the specific needs of homeless households as they move to stable housing and maximize self-sufficiency. Self um, sorry about that. <laughs> um, I have a phone turned off. <laughs> it includes action steps to end homelessness and prevent a return to homelessness. Um, HUD cites that there are four necessary, again, there are four necessary parts a COC must have, which is an outreach section, intake and assessment, um, emergency shelter, transitional housing, and permanent housing. So another critical component of a COC is establishing, like I stated earlier, a coordinated entry system, the CES. And having a coordinated entry system is part of the COC community-wide planning initiative. Um, next slide. 
So here are the four elements of the COC. Um, they're required. So it has to have the outreach and intake assessment. And this is used to identify services and housing needs and make links to appropriate care levels for both. Um, again, I want to, I don't know if I've mentioned this. Each COC is slightly different based on the need of the community. So you're going to see some COCs that have housing navigators to do their outreach, or you're going to see some that have street outreach and diversion or both. So again, each COC difference depending on the need of that community. Um, you're going to have emergency shelters. Now this component is for immediate and safe interventions and alternatives to sleeping on streets. And this is especially for homeless families with children. Um, the third core element is transitional housing. And with transitional housing, you're going to have some support services. And this allows times for families and individuals to gain knowledge and skills needed um, for permanent housing. Because the goal is you don't want to put them in permanent housing without giving them the tools they need to keep their permanent housing. And then again, the ultimate goal is permanent housing and support services. And this provides individuals and families with affordable places to live with services if needed. And um, usually with permanent housing support services, you'll see that with people with disabilities. Next slide. So funding does flow, it flows through HUD to each COC. And each COC must have a designated lead agency. So that's a key thing, a lead agency. Um, the COC lead agency coordinates activities funded by a COC grant, including the physical and compliance activities. Um, the lead agency also vary. It can be either a city or a, a county municipality. Um, a lead agency can be led by a state agency. Um, it could either be managed by a balance of state. Usually when a lead agency is a balance of state, this is usually in rural areas. Um, and also can be lead, led by a nonprofit agency or by a United Funding Agency. Now, the responsibilities of a COC lead agency is they're responsible. They're like standing in um, the gap for HUD. They're responsible for preparing and submitting the grant applications. Um, they're also establishing performance targets and evaluating outcomes and projections for which COCs are awarded. So they are actually the gatekeepers of the grants, but also they are making sure that any agencies that receive funding through the COC, they're in compliance. So they monitor the compliance piece. Um, again, they oversee physical compliance activities. They monitor grant recipients and subrecipients, and they enforce compliance with HUD um, program standards and requirements. So your lead agency is kind of like the big brother for HUD because they're actually in that community. They know what's going on and they're responsible to do all the reporting to HUD. Next slide. Um, and here's some other responsible responsibilities of a lead uh, agency. Um, they're responsible for developing a community-wide process. So they oversee the process for coordination among all the stakeholders that are involved with the COC. Um, collecting reporting community data. Um, this is so important for a COC to collect this data because this is how grant funding is awarded, is based on data collection. This is how they prove that this is the need that's in their community, and these are the type of grants that they need in order to meet the need of, of homelessness. So this is very important. And what they do with that data collection, um, there is a system that they do use, which is called the HMIS, the Homeless Management Information System. This is the sacred system they use to collect all that data to do their reports, but also to use that data to show HUD this is a need we have, and this is why we're requesting this particular funding in our area, our geographical area. Now, now there are some benefits of being actual the uh, lead agency. Um, you get the NOFAs. You know all the NOFAs are coming down the pipeline from HUD. You're updated on that. Um, when you participate in a COC, um, you also get input in voting rights and grants. So this is why it's so important that I'm telling. Um, resettlement affiliates to get involved in their COC to attend the meetings, 
because if you attend the meetings, again, you have voting rights on which grants to apply for through HUD, with HUD through the COC. Now, I want to uh, I want to bring this to your attention. Now, each COC have policy and procedures and requirements for voting rights. So you will need to know what are the voting rights for your actual COC. Some COC uh, requires a certain amount of attendance. So again, that varies depending on where you are. Um, and also it's good networking opportunities. Um, when you're with the COC, you're working with nonprofits, um, state agencies, other entities that are in this fight together to end homelessness and you can learn some best practices from other, um, other um, partners. And then also you get information regarding housing funding. When you are participating in these CLC meetings, you get the updated um, information of what grants are coming down the pipeline, what the requirements are. So that's why it's important to attend these meetings. Next slide. And this is just a snapshot of HUD's exchange. And the reason why I want to show you an example is so easily to find out what your lead agency is in your area. And um, after this presentation, I know Joy sends out the PowerPoint. There is a link where you can get to this HUD exchange and you can actually look up your lead agency and contact them and get the information on how to start attending meetings. So with the snapshot, you could just simply hit um, it's very important that you can see, you click on the COC Community of Care program, as you can see on the left-hand side, I don't know if you're left or my right as I view it, and it says view COCs only. So make sure those two boxes are clicked. And again, you'll put in your respective state and you can find out what the lead agency is. So I'm an example type of person. So as you can see, I have um, this pulled up and you can see the COC lead agencies in that area. For that state. Next slide. So we're going to talk about the coordinated entry system. Um, as stated earlier, HUD requires all COCs to establish a coordinated entry system. And the coordinated entry uh, is a process that's developed to ensure that all people experiencing a housing crisis has fair and equal access to the resources in that area. So this is what the coordinated entry system is responsible for. They are actually the hands that do the work. They want to make sure that the most vulnerable population receives services as soon as possible. Next slide. Um, here's just a summary of what a coordinated entry system is. It is a streamlined system that provides quick access to individuals and families seeking housing assistance through a coordinated referral and housing placement process. Um, the CES is designed to match households with the most appropriate housing and service intervention and to prioritize uh, uh, resources based on the level of need and vulnerability and prevention support and reduce the links of homelessness and increase housing stabilities. Now with the CES, the coordinated entry system, it's gonna be slightly different in each area. So I just wanna put that caveat out there. And HUD requires each CES to have four core elements. Now this is for all CESs regardless of where they're located. This is HUD sanction requirements. They have to have an access point, they have to have an assessment and we're gonna to have to have prioritization and also a referral process. So we're gonna talk about those a little bit in detail. Um, next slide, Grace. So the first requirement is the access point and this is the engagement point for households experiencing a housing crisis. So we're just gonna talk about that. Um, Again, the access point is going to vary depending on the community. Now, I live in Kansas City, Missouri, and the access point to get coordinated entry system services is calling 211. Um, that's not the only access point. You can call 211, or there are some sanctioned nonprofits here that do screenings. They're considered access points. So again, it varies. Now, I know in some communities they have United Way. Now you can call United Way, or which is can be 211 again, depending on where you live. 
that's how you can have an access point. So that's very important. Once you do contact your lead agency, get to know what is the access point in order to get someone screened. Because the access point initial um, step is to do a screening of a household to see if they're eligible for any services, but also to see if they're vulnerable. Um, during that asset, uh, assessment piece, once they have the access point, the next point is the assessment piece. And basically the assessment is to see the housing needs, the, press, the preferences and the vulnerability of that individual or the household. Now, again, this varies in each community. So again, that's why you need to know what these, what, what is available in your community when it comes to assessment. Now, and again, I'm picking on myself, um, in Kansas City, with our assessment, there's different assessment screening tools that they use. Um, I do know they had used to use the VI SPDAT. Again, it's a, a, a screening tool where they ask a series of questions to gauge the vulnerability of an individual or a family, but also see if the services that's currently in their system, they're eligible for it. Then there's also the VAT. That is just an example of a screening tool. Again, each community screening tool is slightly different. So I'm just using Kansas City, Missouri as an example. And um, again, these screening tools is to assess the housing needs of the individual and the family um, and their vulnerability. Um, again, in Kansas City, we do have diversion and intervention case management with our assessment piece. So what happens is when a person is actually getting assessment, if there is some um, light, we call it light case management that can be done on the spot, it is done here in KC. Now, this is not done with every um, CES, so I just want to make sure I put that out there. So there are some intervention case managements that do happen in the assessment um, period. Um, this is one thing that is very important is the prioritization, and this is what looks at the needs and the le level of vulnerability are determined. So after the assessment is done, there is a scoring system that puts them on a prioritization list. Now, the name of the list varies depending on where you live. So here it was considered the prioritization list, but they changed it to the by name list. In some communities, they call it the community housing list. In others, the reason why they have this list, again, is to ensure the person with the greatest needs receives services first. And then we have the next, which is considered the referral of the household. So once a family or individual go through this process, they get on the list. If they qualify for services and they're on that list, once a resource is available in that community, they are connected to the appropriate referral source through this process. Next slide. Now, one of the things that I have been talking to with a lot of resettlement uh, affiliates is um, becoming an access point. Um, like I spoke earlier, there's different ways you can access services to get um, the assessment. Either you can call 211 or United Way, again, depends on your community. Um, and there are also nonprofits that are access point that do this services. Um, if you are a resettlement affiliate and you're thinking about being an access point, there are some benefits to it. Um, you have the ability to do assessments on your clients right then and there. Now, there is training that you have to have in order to become an access, uh, access point. And also, there are some responsibilities behind it. But one of the benefits, when I learned, worked for one of my one profits, we were access point we could do our actual assessments on our clients versus referring them out to get that assessment done. And another good benefit when you are part of an access point, um, you can actually have access to the prioritization list. Again, depending on what the list is called, you can see where that client is on that list and what type of services that they will be referred to once the resource opens up. So you will have access to that instead of you're constantly calling and say, okay, where is my client on that list? Um, again, you can check the status on their on the, their status on the prioritization list, and you can know the availability of the different housing resources in your geographic area when you're an access point. So that's these are some of the benefits. Again, these are great benefits, but there's also responsibilities. 
Um, one of the thing is because of, I know there's a lot that's going on when it comes to resettlement and a lot of turnover and manpower. Um, if you don't have the manpower, um, it could be it could be a burden sometimes. And the one thing about this, when you are an access point, um, you do have to serve other populations. So you do have to screen other populations that are non-refugees or non-newcomers. Um, and that can be difficult, especially if you're short on manpower, even just serving your own clients. Um, there are different types of ways you can be an access point. Um, you can be centralized. That's when you take everybody in, which I would not recommend, especially if you don't have staff members to do that. Um, you can do the no wrong door or you can be a centralized multi-site or you can be a hybrid. One of the things I recommend if you choose to go down this path is to be a hybrid. Now, hybrid is, is say, okay, we're an access point. However, we have certain hours, certain days allocated to when we offer our assessment services. Um, another thing you would have to join mandatory meetings, which require a lot of time commitment to be part of that. Um, so again, these are the benefits, but also um, the responsibilities if you decide to go down that road to be an access point. Next slide, Grace. Okay, I'm gonna go over some more benefits. Um, the engagement point for households experience a housing crisis. Again, I think this is uh, beneficial. Um, you can do the initial screening right then and there um, to see if they're eligible for services. Um, you also have, a, again, a difference in each community. Some communities require you to be part of the 211 or United Way system. So um, if you are an access point, guess what? A lot of those calls are coming through the 211 or United Way will be trickling to you. So just FYI. Um, and then you get staff that's actually trained on the system that is used. Um, again, it varies. It could be the VI that or the VAT. Um, so you are you have you have to have mandatory training. But guess what? Once staff is trained on this, they can know right off the bat where a client is going to stand when it comes to your scoring system. And we can also go to the next slide. I want you to keep this in mind as we talk about this. Um, um, when a client does get an assessment um, through the CES, it does not always guarantee housing assistance, just FYI. And also household with the highest priority are offered housing and supportive su uh, services projects first. So you might have a client once they get assessed, yes, they might need services, but guess what? They may not be high on that list, the scoring list, so just FYI. Um, CSS is not a housing wait list nor a housing application. Again, they coordinated the services and resources through the COC. Um, um, a household may not be eligible for any current housing program openings. And also, there's some things you need to keep in mind. There is no fixed timeline for when an agency may contact a household for housing. So there's times I've seen, again, it depends on the area and what resources are available. I've seen clients be on a list for less than two weeks because the resource was available at that time, but then I can see another client, I've seen me on the list for three to six months. So it does vary depending on what's available, what funding resources are available, and the scoring level of the client. Next slide. Okay, do I have a slide missing? Can you go back a little bit, Grace? There we go. Um, I want to go to the right side. I did go what's in mind, but the reason why I want to go back to the right-hand side of this slide is because I want you to see the overall picture, how everything fits together, the puzzle fits together. So you see you have HUD. HUD is the funding source. HUD then has that funding and it trickles down to the COC, which is the lead agency who oversees the funding requirements. Then you have the CES, um, the coordinated entry system. This is the actual system that facilitates and coordinates and management of all the referrals and all the resources. 
And then it trickles down to if you are a grantee and you actually receive the funding. So if you're a resettlement affiliate and you're interested in this, you would have to be part of the COC because you would be part of the grantee portion. You'd be at that end. Um, you would have to participate and reach your CO, uh, meet your COC participation requirements, but also you have to make sure that your, your service is aligned with that actual grant funding requirements as well. So I kind of wanted you to see the whole full picture. So you have HUD, you have your funding source, you have COC standing in the gap as HUD's representative overseeing the funding requirements and reporting. And then you have your CES, which is actually the hands and legs to actually do the services and to make sure that grantees, if you're a grantee, that you're actually in compliance with your service, which you're actually funded, if you get funding for. Okay, I wanna make sure I backtrack that. So uh, next slide. Um, next slide. So we're not gonna transition into the CLC funding programs. There are so many programs that are funded through the coordinated entry and also through the COC. But in this webinar, I am going to just focus on the main ones, which would be rapid rehousing, um, permanent housing, transitional housing, and their homeless prevention programs. Next slide. So HUD does have categories of homelessness, um, and this is HUD's definition of the different categories. You have category one, which is considered literally homeless. Then you have category two, uh, immediate risk of homelessness. Category three, homeless under other federal status. Four, fleeting, attempting to flee domestic violence. And then you have the homeless prevention at risk of homelessness. So these are the four, uh, one, two, three, four, I'm sorry, five actual definitions of homelessness according to HUD. Next slide. And I'm not gonna go into too much detail, but I'm gonna go give you a summary. Um, in all this information, again, we have a resource page if you wanna really read in depth the definitions. And again, this is HUD's definition, but each CLC actually have policies um, that have to go under what a homeless definition is, but it slightly might be different. So I just want to tell you that. So category one means a person that is literally homeless, okay? And these are individuals and families without a fixed regular uh, place to sleep. Um, they could be leaving, they could be even living in a place that's not considered humane, um, living in a shelter. A lot of people don't know that. If you're actually living in a shelter, you're considered literally homeless. Um, or if you're uh, about to leave an institution where they lived in for 90 days and they have no place to go. Um, again, I'm, these are HUD's definitions. And then you have a category two, um, risk of homelessness. This is an individual or family who would immediately lose their primary nighttime residing provided that the residency be lost within 14 days, almost within two weeks of the homeless assistance application date. There's no new residency. Um, individual, individual or family lacks resources or support networks to find permanent housing. So I should have said this earlier, you're probably like, why are you going over these definitions, Lynette? Well, the reason why is because these definitions determine what type of funding that a client will qualify for. And this is also what they look at when they do the assessment is, what category does this individual fall under in their situation, this individual and family? So next slide. Then you have your category three. Um, this is homelessness under other federal statutes. Um, this is un unoccupied youth who are younger than 25 or families with category three children and youth. I'm not gonna go all to detail again. Um, we have a link to this that you can actually read all this information. And then you have your category four, which is people attempting to flee domestic violence. Um, this is very important because you have a lot of folks that are, uh, not just victims, but sexual, um, being sexually, tra being trafficking, this falls under category four. Um, category four is very kind of broad when it comes to this. Um, and then the next slide. Then you have your homeless prevention. Um, 
this is at risk of homelessness and this applies to ESG grants and recipients. Um, and this kind of highlights what homeless prevention is. Again, this is important to know what homeless prevention is because there are certain COC that have grants just for homeless prevention because the goal is they don't want them to be homeless. So there is some homeless prevention dollars out there. And this is the definition by HUD what homeless prevention is. But again, check with your local age, lead agency to see what their policy and procedures are when it comes to the homeless prevention dollars, if there's any available in that community. Next slide. Next slide. Um, okay, so we're gonna talk about rapid rehousing. Um, rapid rehousing, it does provide short-term um, rental assistance and services. Um, the goal is to help people obtain housing quickly and to increase self-sufficiency. Um, with rapid rehousing, there is no preconditions such as employment, income, um, absence of criminal record or sobriety, and the rapid rehousing typically lasts for 24 months. Again, typically, again, it depends on what resources and funding that is available. Um, after several months of being in this program, this, um, this subsidy amount is gradually reduced in increments um, in a way that supports the individual while getting back on their feet. Um, for example, you can have an individual that enters into the program that's unemployed, then they receive employment, and then their subsidy um, eventually decreases because the goal is to get them um, independent. Again, it varies depending on the community and the funding that is available. So there is a video that I want you guys to watch. Um, it's by the National Alliance to End Homelessness, and this explains the rapid rehousing program.
Thank you, Grace. And hopefully that video um, was helpful and because um, I'm a visual person. <laughs> Um, next slide. So we're going to talk about permanent supportive housing. Um, permanent supportive housing, it does provide indefinite um, leasing and rental assistance combined with supportive services um, for disabled persons experiencing homelessness. So they may live independently. Um, with permanent supportive housing, at least one household member must have a disability. And it could be adult or child and meet additional eligibility criteria outlined in the fiscal year NOFA. So the NOFA will determine, again, what is their additional requirements for the permanent supportive housing. Um, the one thing I like with permanent supportive housing, it does have, it has a funding for supportive services because the goal is to make sure that person have wraparound services to remain permanently housed. Um, if you are curious about who the grantees are in your air, oh, I'm sorry, I skipped over transitional housing. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, transitional housing, it does assist individuals and families with interim stability. Um, again, it varies from community to community and uh, funding availability. It may cover costs up to 24 months. Now, with transitional housing, you must have a signed lease or sublease under this particular grant. And then we have the homeless prevention. Um, again, it varies from community to community. Now, all have the HP money. Um, and this is just for short term or medium term rental assistance. Now, I want to talk about these four. Again, there's additional uh, resources, additional grants through COCs. I'm just talking about the major ones. Um, with these grants, if a client gets referred to either grant, that means they already qualify because they already went through the process of the screening, the assessment, the resources is available. So if they are referred out, for example, you have a client and um, they get the assessment done and it seems that they would qualify for permanent supportive housing, they're on the list. And when a, per a permanent supportive housing does open up and they're referred to that agency for the services, that means they qualify because if they get referred out, they already went through the screening process and the qualification process. And that goes for transitional housing and HP as well. Um, next slide, Grace. And this is a snapshot of, again, the HUD exchange. Um, this is how you can find out what resources or what grant funding is available in your area. Um, for example, I'm, I'm picking on myself because I have Missouri. As you can see, there is the COC name and the organization. Like, for example, you see Care Beyond the Boulevard. And right there on the uh, far right, it tells you the grant amount funding they've received. Um, Missouri Balance of State, the COC, um, that's the actual COC that's overseeing that grant. And to the right, you see the organization, Nate Catholic Charities of Kansas, and you see how much money has been allocated for that particular grant funding. Um, so this is a great tool to use. And let's go to the bottom. Um, this is year 2021. It's typically three years grant. You have the Missouri Balance of States, Catholic Charities of Southern Missouri. I used to work for them. That's why I picked on them. <laughs> And here you can see they have the amount they receive for rapid rehousing. So this is a good report to pull to see, okay, what funding sources are in my community, but what actual COC grant? Is it rapid rehousing? Is it permanent housing? Is it transitional housing? Um, and you can also see if there's additional of, uh, actual funding resources they have outside the four core ones. Um, you can also find out they have homeless prevention as well, but I hadn't pulled that report. I just wanted you to see a report, a snapshot of what it looks like when you pull a report in your area. Again, look to your left, make sure you have the grant year, right grant year, usually grants are three or four year cycles. Um, and then your state, and you can even pull specifically, as you can see, I have the left checked because I want to see the COC, what actual grants came through my COC. Next slide. So we're going to talk about housing first because you have to talk about housing first because it goes with the COC. And you're like, what is the housing first model? Well, the housing first model, it is not a housing assistance program, but is a homeless assistance approach. 
Um, and this approach uh, prioritized providing permanent housing to people experiencing homelessness, thus ending their homelessness and serving as a platform for which they can pursue personal goals and improve their quality of life. Um, without telling my age, um, um, I remember when the Housing First model rolled out. Um, before the Housing First model as a housing case manager, you set certain metrics for your clients. And if those clients met those benchmarks, that's when you pursued housing. You didn't pursue housing first. You had these metrics you had, and once your client met those metrics, that's when you start the housing search. The Housing First model said these things does not work. In order to work with people, you have to work with them where they're at. So guess what? One of the hierarchy of needs is housing. So let's house them first, and then once they are housed, then you can work on those other elements of case management. So we're gonna go ahead and talk about the five principles of the Housing First model, which is very important because this is the model that all the COC programs use. Um, immediate access to permanent housing with no housing readiness requirements. That's immediate. Um, consumer choice and self-determination. Um, it, it, it makes common sense. Why is the person not participating in their own case management? Why are they not setting their own goals? Again, back in the day, you had a lot of case managers. They said, well, I think this is good for the client. I think the client needs this, this, and this. Guess what? When the person is not participating in their own life plan, they're not vested. And part of the Housing First key principle is that person should have a say on where they live in their case management. They have a participant choice. Um, and recovery orientation. Uh, Individualist and participant-driven participant support. Unfortunately, you did have a lot of people out there, they have a cookie case management style. What one case management work for one person, that should work for the other. That's not true. Um, it should be indiv individualized and participant-driven. And some uh, socially and community integration. Okay, my time is up. I have one more video, and this is going to break down the housing first five key principles, and then we're going to wrap it up. Thank you, Joy. I'm sorry. I get excited about this.
So, Grace, we could go ahead and put my um, information the next slide. Now, if you guys want to go back and dive deeper, um, you will be provided the links. Again, if you have any questions, you can feel free to reach out to me, my lpro at cwsglobal.org. Um, and then also, I also encourage you to go to our website. We have a lot of resources on our website. Again, Joy, thank you. I'm sorry I went over time. I didn't realize how much time <laughs> I got to go in. <laughs> No, thank you so much for such great information and presentation. Um, now it's time to just take your question. I don't see questions in the questions box. Um, so please, if you have any questions, as Lynette said, like you can reach out to her or you can send an email back to when I send out the recording and I'll make sure to connect you. Um, and I would like to just um, hear from you and receive your feedback on today's webinar and hear your suggestions for future Lunch and Learn uh, topics. So if you have any topics in your mind that you think would be helpful for you and other volunteers, sponsored co-sponsors and um, agency staff, please let us know um, in the survey. Um, so if you can just scan this QR code um, and finish that survey right now, that would be great. Um, and again, I will be sending out um, the webinar uh, recording uh, following today's webinar. And yeah, so let's just take a minute to just do the survey. And um, again, thank you so much uh, for today, Lynette and those who joined us. And we hope that you have a great rest of your week.